the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations in every lofty thing that raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. To take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ is a purity of submission. It is to recognize that we, in our imperfect state, have our own will, our own desire, our own preferences, our own judgments, and our own conclusions. To take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ is to decide that our will is to become nothing more than a stepping stone to humble discipleship. To take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ is to become that which we have recognized and that which we have decided upon. It is to become the obedient body of Christ, which is to have and obey the mind of Christ. Great. How do you do that? How do you change this into that? How do we have, how do we allow the mind of Christ to override the imperfect human mind that we were born with? How do we allow the mind of Christ to reign supreme in our lives? Brethren, today I want to share with you some answers to these questions that I have been learning and applying. These answers have presented themselves to me based on some pretty big personal failures. You know, they say you learn best through failure. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. And I'm going to share those failures with you. They are frankly embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Because it is only through failure that I learned and am learning to apply the answer to the question of how do you, how do you, how do you become guided by the mind of Christ. And maybe my failure can save you some difficulty. Because, you know, here's a news flash for you. We all learn from failure, but you can learn from somebody else's if you pay really close attention. So today I'm going to sprinkle in and again, something that is, is embarrassing, I had to talk myself into doing this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So, we'll get to that in a minute. Viktor Frankl is an Auschwitz survivor. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And in the book he wrote, quote, Between stimulus and response, there is a space. And he went on to say that in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So we're going to take that philosophical statement and spiritualize it. In our mind, there is a thinking process. First, there's some kind of stimulus, some kind of input. Things happen in life. As part of this stimulus, when something happens in your life, what do you do? You and I react. We all have what some call knee-jerk reactions, and you know what I'm talking about. Somebody says something that, that doesn't set well with you, and, and you immediately, without thinking, there's a reaction in your mind, an instinctive reaction. For good or for ill, it's there. This reaction evokes a two-part process of response. In between these two events, in between the stimulus and reaction and the response, and this is very important, because this is what we're going to come back to throughout this entire discourse. Between the stimulus and reaction and the response, there is a space. Sometimes it's a very small space, but there is always a space. And that's what Viktor Frankl was talking about. In that space lies our destiny. 
For it is in this space that I contend, according to Scripture, it's in this space between the reaction and the response, it's in this space where the mind of Christ comes to live. It's where we can invite the mind of Christ to take up a permanent residence. James actually teaches us about this space. So we're going to refer to James 1, 16 through 22. We're going to quote all the verses as we go through our discussion this morning. I'm not going to quote it now. But um, James 1, 16 to 22 helps us understand this space and how to use it. We will suggest six points from these James scriptures about dealing with this space and therefore dealing with the mind of Christ. We're going to start with James 1, 19. It says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So the first point is the first phrase of the James scripture. Everyone must be quick to hear. Quick to hear. To be alert and focused to truly understand what it is that's happening. Quick to hear. As human beings, we mentioned we're wired to react. You've heard of people having the fight, flight, or freeze reaction. That's human nature. Something happens, and our instinctive physiology gives us an instantaneous direction designed to be good and protective. So, be quick to hear. Quick to hear what? James 1, 16 to 19. Let's go back a few verses. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we would be kind of a first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren. And we'll, we'll stop there. Quick to hear what? Quick to hear godly instruction, godly encouragement, and godly examples. Now, sometimes because of the difficult and often emotional experiences of our lives, our physiology our human body-mind combination reacts in a way that paralyzes us. And that paralyzed reaction puts us in a place that, uh, to, to have a response that is not good, not healthy, and not protective. Let me give you an example. This is not my failure, but this is just part of my, <laughs> my, my personal being and, and, and how I work. There are certain things that I react to physically inside when they happen. I can't stand being late. And literally, if I am late, my stomach just churns up in a knot. I just can't stand being late. So when I, I work in a, in a business where I see people, and I'm always early for appointments. And so if I set an appointment for 10 o'clock, they know I'm there at 5 of because that's just, I cannot tolerate something about it. I don't know what it is, but if I'm late, and you know that feeling, right? That feeling in the pit of your stomach that's like, Ugh. I also can't stand not being responsible. If I have bills to pay, and I don't pay them, if I forget, and even if it's legitimate, I forget, what happens is that same gut feeling and that awful anxiety inside. Those are, those are some of my physiological responses. And I'm telling you this because this is where sometimes our reaction paralyzes us and our response doesn't end up what it should be. So we'll get back to that. So that's a little bit about, now you know something you probably didn't know. <laughs> King David committed some pretty awful sins. We know, we know the story. We're not going to go through the story of his sins. You know, but among them, it was the arranging for the death of his trusted soldier, Uriah, because the king had gotten Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, pregnant. David's decisions at that point in his life, in those, in those moments of his life, were all about preserving himself and his ego. He did a cover-up of his sins. You see, David was quick to hear the wrong things. He was quick to hear what his desire wanted. And he responded based on that desire. And he could not have been more wrong. Enter Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, 5 um, through 13. We're going to break it up a little bit. Nathan tells a story that sounds like it's a story of somebody in his kingdom that needs judgment. 
Nathan tells the story, remember, of the, of, of the, the, the man, the poor man whose, whose ewe lamb was, was stolen, and, and David is furious. And it says in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5, David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this and he had no compassion. See, David heard. David reacted. And David responded right there. He heard the story. His reaction was, it's not right. And his response was instantaneous based on that reaction. Verse 7. David's going to need to hear again. Nathan then said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel. It is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. Nathan goes on. David is quick to hear. And now he responds. Verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has taken away your sin, you shall not die. So you see, there was a reaction and response in the original uh, experience, but there's a better reaction and response here. He is quick to hear. David had been quick to hear his own desire, and now he was quick to hear the judgment of God. Quick to hear it and to respond to it with pure acceptance and humility. So finding the mind of Christ lesson. While valuable and necessary, to be quick to hear can be a dangerous step if, it's not, um, if all the other steps are not taken. And we're going to go over the other steps as we go through this, this 45 minutes together. It's, almost, it's easy, almost effortless, to place the wrong input in our lives into a position of influence. Let me say that again. It's easy, it's almost effortless, to take the wrong input and put it into a position of influence in our lives because we're quick to hear the wrong things. Never be quick to hear without the other steps. So what are they? James 1.19, again, this you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let's focus on slow to speak as step number two. Finding the mind of Christ we're quick to hear, there's a space, and we're slow to speak. Slow to speak. Stretch out this space between our reaction, caused by whatever happened in our life, and our response far enough to adequately and appropriately decide on a right course of action. Okay. Failure alert, do not try this at home. <laughs> Several years ago, I run, I run a small business, and um, I used to do advertising in local yellow pages for my business, just so people knew where I was. And that's a pretty innocent thing to do. And several years ago, while working one day, I got a call from a yellow pages company saying I didn't pay my bill. Now, what did I tell you happens when I'm not responsible? My stomach gets in a knot and I'm mortified. And I was so embarrassed. And so I said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll pay the bill. Now, brethren, the person who called me, the Yellow Pages who called me, was not real. It was a scam. I didn't know. But I was so mortified at not paying my bill that I paid them. Because it's like, how can I not do that? And for the rest of the day, I'm going to say, Rick, what is wrong with you? A few months later, I got a call from another Yellow Pages company. There are a couple of different directories, and I got the same story. And they said, look, you know, we're going to have to put this to collections. I'm saying, no, don't do that. My stomach's in knots. I get short of breath. I'm like, How, what is wrong? And I'm thinking, man, I must be losing my mind, and I paid my bill. Well, I thought I paid a bill. I paid a scammer is what I did. I'll stop the story there. There's more and it doesn't get better, okay? <laughs> and like I said, this is embarrassing, and um, bottom line, brothers, I was quick to hear for all of the wrong reasons. I was quick to hear 
for all of the wrong reasons. So let's talk about slow to speak, creating and using the space to sort things out. The following example is one of great faith displayed in being quiet and following God, even though it looks like a complete folly and even death in this example. Gideon and his army were about to do battle with the Amalekites. Well, and you know the story. Gideon had a strong and numerous army, and the Amalekites were also vast. Judges 7, 12 tells us, Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand of the seashore. So this is a mighty army that they are going to face. Gideon had... 30,000 men. I mean, he had, he, had a, he had a mighty army of his own. But see, Gideon was in tune with God's will. Let's watch how he is quick to hear and slow to speak. Judges 7, 1 through 3. Then Gideon and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian, Midian into thy hands. For Israel would become boastful and say, my own power has delivered me. See how good we are. That's a paraphrase. Now therefore, God speaking, come, proclaim in the hearing of the people and say, whoever is afraid, whoever is trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned but 10,000 remained. So, you're getting ready to fight this massive army and you just lost 68% of your fighting force. What would your reaction be? How do you, what, what happens inside of you when you see most of your army running away? Notice Gideon doesn't complain because he had already decided to follow the will of God. His response was obedience. Judges 7, verses 4 through 8. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. So he brought the people down to the water and you know the story about how they drink and the ones that, that are, 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 are on their guard are the only ones that can stay. So the number of those who lapped up the water with their hands to their mouth was 300 men. But the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. Now you have 300. You have lost 99% of your fighting force. What would your reaction be? Gideon had a response already in place. I'm not going to talk about his reaction yet. But his response was already predetermined because he had already determined, already decided, it was already firmly in his mind he would follow the word of God, period. So his response was obedience. But God knew that his reaction was not obedience. His reaction was terror. God knew it. So he said to him, verse 7, Judges chapter 7, the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who lapped and will give you the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his home. So the 300 men took the people's provisions and their trumpets into their hands, and Gideon sent all the other men of Israel each to his tent, but retained the 300 man, men, and the camp of Midian was below in the valley. So Gideon is now afraid, but he's still following the word of God, and he's preparing this teeny, tiny little army. Now he's going against maybe 30 or 40,000 men. And you know how many people he's got? About as many as are in this auditorium. Try fighting a stadium full of people with what we have here. It's not going to come out well, unless God is on your side. Gideon, though, is afraid. Just because he had decided to follow the will of God didn't mean that his reaction wasn't human. And that is such an important part of understanding the mind of Christ. Just because you decide doesn't mean you're not afraid. Judges 7, verses 10 and 11. And God says to him, but if you are afraid, and he knew he was, go down with Purah, your servant, down to the camp. You will hear what they say and 
afterwards your hands will be strengthened that you may go down and fight against the camp. God provides for him. He realizes he's afraid. He realizes his human reaction is not God honoring. So he helps him. And he gives him space to verify that response of obedience. And Gideon go, does go down to the camp, and he hears the men talking, and it encourages him, and he is strengthened. So our finding and applying the mind of Christ lesson here is to choose the mind of Christ, is to choose to not instinctively follow how we feel. Rather, it is to follow what we believe in. It is to choose to instinctively follow not what we feel, but what we believe in. And in the space where you make that choice, that's where the mind of Christ, that's where you invite it to take up residence in your life. Brethren, your reaction does not define who you are. Your mind of Christ does. So what I'm saying from these scriptures, from my own experience is, we're going to react. We're human. And it's okay. But it doesn't have to define you. So just because your reaction is paralysis, like in my case, it didn't have to end up being the defining point in my experience. Back to James 1.19. You know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and the third step is slow to anger. Finding the mind of Christ, being slow to anger. In that space, anger is a reaction. Use the space between the reaction and response to pin anger down, to control it and not allow it to be your response but to be a tool of your response if it's necessary. See, anger does have a positive application. Rarely. But when it does, use it appropriately. The space between the reaction and the response is where we can pin anger down. Back to my failure. Every time I think about it, I just, it's a whole reaction thing. <laughs> I got phone calls from several companies over the next several months. Different names, some of these people on the phone were rude, some of them were really nice. Bottom line is they were all scammers. And I finally figured out that, look, it's not me, it's them. And I was really angry. You know, and with those who were rude, I wanted to be rude back. Because they were stealing. And my reaction, every time the phone rang, I've, you know, everybody has a caller ID. And in my office, you know, I could tell. See, I've got some of my clients that when they call me, their, their number comes up, private caller. So when it comes up private caller, I have to answer the phone because it could be one of my clients. Well, a lot of these people that came up private caller, I didn't know what I was going to get. So I would, I would answer the phone, and it would be a scammer. And they'd say, well, you know, Mr. Sarasi, we want to talk to the people in charge of advertising. And I would say, that's me. And they'd say, well, you know, you owe us money because we had this thing and this contract. And, and so now I'm wanna, I want to yell at them because they're, they're, they're not nice. So I, I tried to get through. Well, first of all, be, be, before, before that, I would see the caller ID, and in my instant reaction was my stomach would get in a knot and I'd take a breath and it's like I couldn't let it out again. Okay, this is, and, and again, this is embarrassing, but it's the truth. I was paralyzed by what was happening and they'd start speaking and it was like, uh, can you imagine me not being able to speak? I mean, come on. But, but this is the honest truth. This is what happened. It was so paralyzing and, and I would have to work through it and say, okay, you know who it is, you know what this is about, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So I got to a point where I reacted to them uh, once I would, was able to pull myself together. And again, it's embarrassing, but my, my voice would tremble. Even though I knew what I was dealing with, I, it would still tremble. But then I would say to them, i say, okay, I'm happy to pay you as soon as you show me the contract. And that was a way that I could deal with it. I, I would say, I, I wasn't going to call them a liar, but I was going to say, I'm happy to pay you. Just, Here's my fax number. Fax me the contract, and then we'll talk. 
because I knew they didn't have one, and I would be really kind, and they would all hang up eventually, because there's nowhere where to go. Each new call provoked the paralysis, and I needed to consciously plow through it, to stop the reaction, to say, I am not going to respond based on that. I have to respond with something different. So this is part of the growth process. I'll come back to that story in a bit. Let's talk again about being slow to anger in finding the mind of Christ. Let's look at the Apostle Paul, slow to anger. The Apostle Paul, before King Agrippa, he's telling his story of his conversion. And he's telling his story of his own blind ambition. So in Acts 26, 9 through 25, we won't read the whole thing, but, so then I thought myself to, that I had to do many things hostile in the name of, uh, to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Think about that. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I believed I had to do hostile things to the name of Jesus. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously engaged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. This was the Apostle Paul's reaction and response before his conversion. He was angry and he acted on the anger, did not think of the consequences. And he was acting unjustly, but he did it anyway. He was not slow to anger. Paul's reaction fed and provoked his response. His anger fed and provoked the angry response. And so, Paul is then converted. He's journeying. He sees the vision, and he hears the words of Jesus. Why do you persecute me? And, and here's Paul's new reaction here. He hears the words of Jesus, and his reaction is, Who are you, Lord? There's a new reaction. And Jesus answers, I am Jesus, whom thou art persecuting. Stand on your feet. I've got work for you to do. And here's Paul's new response. Verse 19 of Acts 26. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. See the response? A new reaction. He paused. Ananias came to him and baptized him. And his response was, I was not disobedient. And I'm a changed man. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses and, uh, was said going to take place, that Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be, put to the, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish and the Gentile people. While Paul was saying this, Festus said in a loud voice, here comes a reaction and response, Paul, you are out of your mind. Reaction, response. Your great learning is driving you mad. And isn't that how we typically react, brethren? We feel it, and we say it, and we follow through with it. But Paul said, it didn't say Paul yelled. It says Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. See how he's respectful? But I utter words of sober truth. Paul's new reaction space and response. In that space, he found the mind of Christ and lived the rest of his life with that process in place. Paul is firmly set in a mind of Christ mode. Thus, fear and anger do not sway him any longer. James 1.20, next verse in our James uh, theme, anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Our finding and applying the mind of Christ lesson. To choose the mind of Christ is to choose to not be swept away with the current of our own anger, but rather to respond in the love of Christ, where anger can be sparingly used as a tool to the glory of God. How often did Jesus get mad? A few times, but just a few. Why did he get angry? It was to witness to the power and glory of God. He did not act on anger because he felt like it. He acted on anger because it was appropriate to the glory of God. 
So when it says, be slow to anger, what it's saying is, quick to hear, get the stimulus and, 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 and reaction, slow to speak, have a space, and if anger is involved, be really slow to move toward that as your response. Your mind of Christ response takes away the authority of your reaction. In most of our lives, the gut reaction that we have demands authority and hangs on to it. The mind of Christ can release us from that reaction so that we can have a sanctified response. It takes the authority of the reaction away. So one of the lessons here is you're going to react. And it's okay. Just use the space to apply the mind of Christ so the reaction has no authority. Let the mind of Christ take that authority. <clears throat> James 1.21. Let's continue. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Finding the mind of Christ, putting aside all filthiness. Establish yourself as having rejected the human default of a sinful and broken basis for decision making. This is a replacement. You have to put aside all filthiness. It's telling you to take something out and the next step is going to be to put something else in. There's a replacement happening. Failure alert. Here we go back to the story. I bet you can't wait. <laughs> I can. Over many months, I, as I mentioned, I received many calls from many companies I'd never heard of. Same story, trying to get money. They didn't deserve it. It wasn't theirs, and sometimes it was intimidating. And wanting to condescend back, I had to learn not to. And when you get really mad when somebody's doing something unjust, it's another thing I can't tolerate. But I forced myself to learn to rise above that. And when I would talk to them after a while, and this went on for months and months and months. And I will tell you, this has been several years. I've been contacted by over 30 companies over the last several years. I, and look, years now, I, it's been the same thing. And, and in, in that period of time, um, I've had to grow because I wanted my response to be something better. So I got to the point where I would kindness them to death. And I would say, really, listen, you know, here's the situation. We really don't have, I don't even know who you are. We never had a business relation. And I would just talk to them kindly, but firmly. Like, you know, and there's nothing, there's nothing that you can say to me because you, I know you don't have any proof. And I would go on and they would hang up. So I would kindness them until they would hang up. And I felt a lot better about it because now my response was at least reflecting something positive. It wasn't complete yet, but it was reflecting something positive. Put the story aside. Putting aside filthiness, depravity, or dishonor. Putting aside the, the, the want to nail them down. Because I wanted to, and believe me, I could be like that. It's not good. The next example, in, re, in, in regards to putting aside all filthiness. Example is a classic example regarding what we hear, what we process, and what we decide. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're just going to sum it up for you. Numbers 13, 25 to 32. This is the, the, 12, the spies that go into the land of Canaan. Ten come back with a bad report. They come back and they say they knew the land was extraordinary and, and, and abundant. They brought back proof. That's what they knew. What they saw was the shadow of the military might and power that they saw powerful in, in stature of the tribes of men who abode there, they saw ominous obstacles. And the way they reacted is they honored dishonor to the will of God. They honored dishonor to the will of God in their thinking. They concluded that it would only be trouble to go into the land. Joshua and Caleb, though, had it different. In verse 30, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it. What did Joshua and Caleb see? They saw the same thing. They saw the land was abundant. They saw God's promise and God's command. And they honored a godly victory that was waiting for them if they would simply take the next steps. But what happened? The people were afraid. And they didn't go. The human reaction default 
was fear and faithlessness. And brethren, oftentimes fear leads to faithful, faithlessness. Fear can be transformed to faithfulness. But most often, unless we use that space between the reaction and the response to apply the mind of Christ, fear leads to faithlessness. So finding and applying the mind of Christ lesson for the putting aside of all filthiness. To choose the mind of Christ is to choose the abandonment of the sinful human responses and adopt responses that reflect the promises and commands of God through Jesus. It's a replacement factor. You've got to put it aside and pull something else and put it in its place. Brethren, don't beat yourself up because you react. We all do. Find your voice in how you respond with the mind of Christ rather than your voice in the reaction. We look at our reaction and we say, I must be terrible, I must be awful. And brethren, I know you do that because I do that. And, and, you know, just a quick side note. One of the reasons I want to, I'm telling you this, this failure of mine is because a lot of times brethren look at brethren up here and think we're different. I speak for myself, we're not. We're the same. We have the same faults, the same difficulties, the same trials, the same weaknesses in our own reactions. James 121, we need to move forward here. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Receive the word implanted. See, that's the replacement. You put aside filthiness, and what do you put in its place? The word implanted. Embrace the new, higher spiritual default for decision-making of enlightened thinking. Let me conclude my failure story. I, think, I don't know if I mentioned to you, the most recent phone call I got from one of these companies was last Thursday. And now what happens, I still have the reaction, but it's not nearly as big. I see the private caller thing, and I get a little bit of a twinge in my stomach, and then I smile. Because now I've determined that I want the call to be beneficial to the person on the other end. So after all this time, when I get on the phone with them, my, my response to them is, I'm going to assume, Terry or John or Jim or whoever you are, that you're an honest person, correct? And they'll say yes. I say, good. I want you to know that the company you work for is engaging in dishonest business practices, and it's shameful. And if I were you, I would look into the company you work for, because they're stealing money from people. So my response now, because now I want it to be beneficial. I don't want to just get off the phone. I want them to hear about the dishonesty and maybe prick their conscience just a little bit. They still hang up on me. But at the end, it's feeding them something positive. And the reaction is no longer of any consequence, even though it's still there a little bit. Brethren, it's taken me years to get to that point. And I I'm guessing I've gotten about 150 phone calls over this period of time from these 30-something different companies. I got put on some list. I don't know how it happened. But you know, now, although it was an expensive lesson, I am glad for the lesson because it taught me about applying the mind of Christ. Let's look at enlightened thinking here. It's hard to attain this, a level of enlightened thinking, for it truly does, uh, does walk above the frenzy. Enlightened thinking walks above the frenzy and the fray of life and dwells in the safe haven of God's will and the safe haven of Jesus' own footsteps. And brethren, to me, this is the core of the lesson. Jesus himself, our Lord, had to consciously engage in enlightened thinking especially when faced with the deepest trial of his life. In Matthew 26, 37 to 44, he's praying in the garden. He wants something to be removed. His humanity is reacting to the immense size of the trial. I believe what he wants removed is being crucified as a blasphemer. And he prays three times. That's his reaction. Jesus' reaction is, I want to get this removed. But his response because he created the space with prayer. What was Jesus' response? It was one word. Nevertheless. In other words, it doesn't matter how I feel. What matters is the glory of God. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That is the mind of Christ, spoken by Christ himself in one of the most difficult moments of his entire human existence. Reaction, space, response. Our finding and applying the mind. And incidentally, how well did Jesus do with that? Brother Tom, in his discourse yesterday on Hebrews 12 too, what did it say he did with the shame? He disregarded it. He completely overcame the reaction. He made it small. That is the mind of Christ. Finding and applying the mind of Christ lesson to choose the mind of Christ is to choose, it is to embrace God's will. And Jesus' footsteps is our default, as our implanted response. To react is human. To respond with the mind of Christ is new creature. To react is human. To respond with the mind of Christ is new creature. And very quickly, step six, James 1.22, prove yourself doers of the word. Prove yourself doers of the word. What that means is consistently apply steps one through five again and again and again and again because in all of your life, we react. In all of our life, we have a space. In all of our life, we can choose the mind of Christ to respond. And so, be quick to hear the right things. Be slow to speak. Slow it down. Pray. Find the mind of Christ. Be slow to anger. Put aside all filthiness. Receive the word implanted. And then do it again. Those are the six steps. This is how the mind of Christ works. Our finding and applying the mind of Christ lesson, we all react and sometimes we don't even notice it. The bottom line is, it's okay. So long as we choose our response. To choose wisely, we must choose the mind of Christ. And we can only make this choice if we allow it to live in the space between reaction and response. It's difficult. It's not natural. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. We're not going to read the whole thing. It explains it. But the last phrase, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind that is so sanctified and pure that it can only lead to God's will, God's way, and God's victory in us. Christ in you. Christ's mind in you. The hope of glory. Brethren, react, pause, and engage the mind of Christ, and then respond to his honor and his glory. Amen.